These photographs were taken at the first detonation of a thermonuclear device in the history of the world. Produced a fireball nearly two miles in diameter. unprotected living thing within three miles of ground zero could have survived. It tore a crater in the earth 175 feet deep, almost a mile across. And when its initial force had died down, the island of Eucalap in the Pacific was no longer there. But a lot of that island was up here, transformed into millions of tiny particles of radioactive debris. These particles would soon begin to fall to earth. There is little anyone can do to save life in a thermonuclear weapons area of total destruction. But under this cloud of fallout and the places where the particles will fall, there is much that can be done to save life. This is the cloud of a thermonuclear explosion. All of us in the world today live under another kind of cloud, the threat of thermonuclear war. I'm Dave Garraway, and you and I live in a world where weapons to create that kind of war do exist. In fact, perhaps that very existence of the weapons has managed to keep the sometimes precarious peace. But even as our government works patiently and earnestly to eliminate this specter from the world, that of war, it might happen after all, in spite of every effort we make to prevent it. And that is the basic fact of life in this thermonuclear age. If there were such an attack on our country, what would it be like? More than a score of very complicated and extensive studies have been made by the military analysts in the Defense Department about that subject. They've included almost every realistic fact you can imagine. The kind of attack on cities, on military targets, combinations of cities and targets, attack masses varying in weight from 2,000 to 13,000 megatons. The results are, well, ugly, I guess, is about the best word you can say. But they do show one thing inconsistently. That tens of millions of Americans would escape the blast and heat effects of the bomb, only to be subjected to the even more widespread danger of fallout radiation and death from that. Now, fallout is not a mystery. It's not a gas or mist, a shroud enveloping the Earth in silent death or anything like that. That's science fiction there, really. Fallout is tangible. It's real. It's millions of tiny little particles picked up in the ground burst of a nuclear explosion and heavy enough to fall back to the Earth within hours. It goes up and it comes down. That's all. It's like those tinsel scraps you just saw. It lands on the Earth and it stays there. It doesn't hang up in the air. And where something stops it, it doesn't go. For example, underneath this, you see, there's nothing. It's stopped by the box. It does emit what scientists call gamma radiation. And although the radiation from these particles cannot harm inanimate objects, like a bar of uh, chocolate or this beef stew, there's the chocolate bar. You see, it just comes off and you can eat it. But the gamma radiation can destroy living cells and can cause sickness and death. Radiation has always been with us. In fact, radiation seems to be the essence of matter itself. It is what the stars are made of. It is what comes from the stars to us. Radiation strikes, for example, the surface of the Earth from our sun. But the dangerous part is largely shielded out by our atmosphere. Dangerous radiation in small quantities occurs inside the Earth. It comes from radioactive elements in the Earth, uranium and radium. We live with some background radiation at all times. Some of the things that men make, like x-ray machines, make dangerous radiation. But with this man-made thing, the thermonuclear bomb, 
radiation becomes a deadly peril. The initial burst of gamma radiation may last only a minute. Still, that's long enough to kill anyone exposed in this area around ground zero. Blast and heat would add to the amount of destruction here, and in case of attack, millions of lives would be lost. But for many millions more, the greater threat would come later. Defense Department studies show that even under the most massive attack, most areas of our country would not be affected by blast, heat, or initial radiation. The more widespread danger would be the radioactive fallout. In here, particles of earth and debris become radioactive and give out gamma rays, which as that cloud expands and drifts, emanate from the particles as they fall back to earth. A human being trying to protect himself from this highly radioactive early fallout has basically three allies. They are distance and mass and time. Distance means keeping the particles as far away from you as possible because the gamma radiation, in a similar manner to heat radiation, is much more intense. I can feel that. Um, so can the pack here. <laughs> when you're close to it than when you're far away, it goes down as a square. Mass means putting a barrier or a shield between you and the source of radiation, which too cuts down the intensity of the penetrating gamma rays. Now, in this case, gamma rays are quite different from heat rays or radiation. Gamma is much more like X-rays. It goes right through. It penetrates anything to some degree. Very small in some cases, but a degree. A fluoroscope is a good example of that. It's an X-ray machine with a fluorescent screen out here. And if I put this successive block of wood like this in back of this, you can see as the wood gets thicker, the less radiation gets through. A little bit always does, but uh, a tiny amount doesn't matter. It's the quantity that's important. Time is the third important ally because, generally speaking, the radiation from early fallout particles decays and loses its power quite fast. Most people, I think, are not aware of this. As a rule of thumb, uh, you might say that for every sevenfold increase in time, radiation in early fallout goes down 90 percent. Uh, for instance, the radiation from particles seven hours after an explosion is but one-tenth of what it was after one hour. That is, 90 percent has been lost. In seven times seven hours, or 49 hours, just about two days, it's down to one one-hundredth of what it was at one hour. That is, one-tenth of 10 percent. And in two weeks, it's down to one one-thousandth. Of course, in any particular place, it uh, would also depend on the amount of fallout and whether it was still building up or not. But even in a massive attack on this country, only some four or five percent of the land area would likely to be struck by the immediate blast and heat. Here, of course, the casualties would be very high. But beyond that, in the vast area not directly hit, that would be subject to the spreading fallout radiation. And it's here that protection is feasible. Here, where fallout shelters could make the difference between survival and death for millions and millions of our people. A shelter, whether it's large or small, above or below ground, is, of course, designed to take advantage of the three allies we've mentioned. First, distance. Distance by the mere fact that it's keeping the particles away from you. Second, mass. Mass by keeping walls and ground and sand and steel and anything which would act as a shield between you and the particles and therefore cut down on the amount of radiation which gets to you. And time. Time because a shelter stocked with the minimum needs for survival, that is food, water, sanitation, medical supplies, instruments to measure radiation, gives you that time. Enables survivors to remain inside shelters long enough for the fallout radiation outside to decay to safe levels. The word uh, safer, of course, is a comparative word. The radiation effects from nuclear weapons can never be uh, considered perhaps completely safe, but for all practical purposes, it gets that way. And in addition to the intensely radioactive early fallout, most of which uh, decays quite quickly, as we said, there are residual radioactive elements with very long lives, like strontium-90, which uh, go in the upper atmosphere and descend over many years sometimes, all over the Earth. I think it would be undoubtedly uh, true to say it probably has some effect on life over a period of many years or generations, but we don't fully know yet. The crippling, killing danger of concentrated early fallout, though, is our real concern, a far greater and more immediate threat. All radiation presumably causes some damage to some living things. When it strikes living cells, some of the cells are destroyed. 
And generally, the higher the intensity, the more damage it does. The body, as a matter of fact, uh, tries and does repair much of the damage if the radiation isn't too high. But if it does continue in larger amounts than the body can stand, or it adds up by repeated exposure, so the total dose is great, well, then the body's natural repair mechanism just can't keep up, and the damage becomes more serious and often fatal. Radiation is not contagious. Stored food, for example, is not hurt by radiation. And even if exposed to fallout, that food can still be used if the particles of fallout are simply removed from the can by washing or cleaning or peeling a can. Stored water is safe, too. Ordinary filtration processes would remove most particles from open water if they hadn't already settled at the bottom. And further protection after the initial period in a shelter was over would entail checking of hot spots, uh, that is, keeping track of accumulated radiation doses and keeping them low. And decontamination. And all this while the work of recovery and reconstructing a society went on. And the key to survival of the people is the fallout shelter. That shelter may vary in size from this home basement shelter for three to a corridor on the sixth floor of an office building, which can accommodate 60 people, perhaps. Or to this underground garage, which will shelter over 2,000 people. These shelters are the shields against the danger of fallout radiation. Radiation is the basic energy of the cosmos. It's a common tool in the 20th century. Radiation is power, the source of the future, which tantalizes the imagination. And yet the most destructive weapon man has ever fashioned, the thermonuclear bomb, and the war that might result from it, is a threat to the very existence of those people who have so succeeded. The bomb would be indiscriminate in its effects. Nobody wants the bomb. Most of us pray it may never happen. But it is possible. And if it is, it's a threat to you. And if it is, then that is your responsibility, along with everyone else's, to help try to prevent it. And at least to understand what it is and what the various organs of government are doing about it and what you yourself can do. And that's a great deal. This program explored, and rather briefly, one aspect of civil defense in this nuclear age in which we live, the effect of fallout and radiation, the threat against which protection is feasible.